Hi all, this is the badging video for the Shipoko Pro at Make Haven. For those who are familiar with the previous Shipoko that we had, this one is similar in layout, but significantly different in, in actual use. So a CNC router, such as this one, is great at doing precise work. It has it uses end mills. End mills are sort of like drill bits, except that in addition to cutting down, they can also cut sideways. Using that ability, you can cut out all sorts of cool things. Say, you know, the most simple might be a perfect circle, but you could also do intricate designs. You can do three-dimensional work where you could, you know, say, make something that goes up and down. Uh, you can you can do all kinds of cool things on here if you can figure out how to clamp it to the work surface and then how to get the design into the computer. So those are what we're gonna what we're gonna cover in terms of safety with uh, this machine. There is a risk of starting a fire, so you do need to stay with the tool while it's running. Um, if you need to run out, feel free to pause it. But this thing is spinning super fast right next to wood, so it can you know pack down a bunch of sawdust in there and and catch it on fire you know, if you're not careful. Uh, there's also a vacuum that's pulling air through there, so it's, it is a potentially combustible situation. Uh, aside from fire, as long as you aren't putting yourself near the cutting end of things, it isn't too dangerous in that way, but as always in the wood shop, eye protection, because this can break and go flying, um, and then making sure hair, necklaces, ties, sleeves, whatnot, are, are well out of the way of the machine. <clears throat> this head, moves, the, the, this whole gantry moves, you know, all around and fairly quickly and, and with a you know, fair amount of force. So make sure to not be leaning on it or something like that because it could whack you and, and could probably hurt. So what we're going to do here is walk through using the machine, um, each of the steps required and some of the other bits of information that will be useful while you're using it. Um, and we're just going to start by turning it on. The power button is right here. So that's glowing blue. Uh, occasionally, you know, if the if the machine is being funny, you might just try restarting it. You know, when in doubt, that's often a, a good thing to try. Over on the wall here, we have some accessories that we'll get to when we get there. Here, just you know, so you have a sense of the layout. This is a bit setter. So what this does is it can come over and touch off here with the tool, so it knows how long the tool is. So that's a that's a great feature. And then you might also notice back here the vacuum. So the vacuum you turn on man manually and it vacuums out through here. This has a magnetic dust shoe, which is very convenient for changing the tools. You can just pop that right on and off. And then we're gonna head over to the computer console, which is where we're gonna start. So uh, normally the computer can just stay on. We'll just wave the mouse and click the keyboard to get it to wake up. Um, can close out of here and we'll just close everything to pretend that we just started up the computer and there are two programs here that we're going to use so if you were used to the the previous CNC router here which used easel which was web based this is different these are you know applications that are on the computer um, that's good because it helps to maintain a, a good connection with the router but uh, the downside is you know, if you want to bring files here, you need to bring them on a flash drive or email them. They won't just stay in Easel. Um, so, and you can also download these programs. You can just Google Carbide Motion. Well, that's probably not going to be so useful to you, but you can download Carbide Create, and that is where you can make your designs and then just bring those files here to actually cut them using Carbide Motion. So we will open Carbide Create first.
So now that the machine is on, uh, what we can do is think about taking a work piece and securing it down. Um, what we're going to do is take this piece of particle board. You can cut all sorts of materials on here that are, you know, plastic, wood. We can't cut metal in the wood shop, um, but you can cut plastics and, and wood on here, melamine, stuff like that. Uh, and we'll clamp it down. In, in this case, we'll just you know, make some funky design as we practice using the software. For clamping on here, we're going to use the accessories that live right over here. So in this bin are some of the hold downs and then these are just some other accessories including an Allen key which we will use. So I'm just going to grab a few of these green clamps. We're just going to slide this piece of aluminum into the T-track and you can slide them you know, anywhere along the length that you want obviously. In general it's good practice to have the clamps be angled a bit downwards. Um, but in this case, we're able to get four clamps on here. So what we can do is, is just have them angled a bit upwards and we'll clamp like that. And I'm not gonna tighten it down too hard just yet. Um, we want it to be lined up to something. Now, if we were, let's say we were cutting a circle out of here, then we could have this at all kinds of a crazy angle. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but let's say we wanted to make this a sign and we wanted to cut a name into this then we would want that name to be centered and squared up and not at a weird angle. So what we could do is just align the front of this piece of wood to the front edge of these, you know, of the table here. Now we know it'll be nice and straight to the table. So now that it's straight, I'm going to clamp all of them down a little more securely. And so for this Shipoko Pro XXL, the cutting dimensions of it are 33 inches wide, 33 inches long, and 4 inches high. Uh, and then something to familiarize yourself with is this is the, the X axis. So X means moving back and forth this way, Y means front to back this way, and Z is up and down. So X, Y, Z. And it generally goes from X negative to X positive, Y negative to Y positive, and Z negative to Z positive. So our material is, is locked down, and now we can go look at the software to figure out how we're gonna cut this. I'm just gonna put this back in the box. All right, so the computer is normally on. What we can do is just you know wave the mouse around or hit the space bar to get it to wake up. If the computer is off, it lives underneath the CNC, so feel free to turn it back on. Um, these two programs are not web-based like Easel. They live on the computer, so you can download them. More specifically, you can download Carbide Create, which is where you'll design the files. And if you want to bring them over here, you can email them, use Bucket, put them on a flash drive, however you want to bring them over here. Uh, the benefit of having it be computer-based is it's less likely to lose the connection, so that should help to have more reliable cuts. So we'll start by opening Carbide Create. And we want, we're going to, this isn't quite as, as sleek as Easel, but it does have a little more functionality, which hopefully will be useful. So we are going to start with the setup and we're going to tell it the stock size. So the width, height, thickness, etc., of our material. Um, and I'm just going to measure those using a, a tape measure. So the width is 19 inches. The height is 12. So width 19, height 12, and then the thickness of this material is 3 quarters of an inch. 0.75. Okay, and now this is a pretty important box here. So this is saying the zero height. And you can see that little red dot is on the bottom of the material. It says bottom there. And what that means is it's going to think of zero as being on the table. And then up at 0.75 is the top. 
of your material. And the reason why that's important is because this is where you're going to zero your, your bit. It's going to be on the table. Um, and then going up from there is positive. The, the times when you would do this is when you're cutting all the way through your material, you're cutting out a shape. And the reason you would want to zero off of the table in this case is because then you know exactly where the table is and you're not going to cut too shallow and you're not going to cut too deep because you're zeroed exactly off of the, the surface of the table. But let's say you're just engraving a sign, then you don't really care where the surface of the table is. You want it to be an exact depth into your material. And so in that case, you would click top. And now you're saying from the top, I want to cut exactly a quarter of an inch in or something. You still tell it that the material is three quarters of an inch thick so that you know it knows and it can tell you when you're gonna cut through. Um, but it's, but in this case, you know, you're, you're zeroing off the surface so it knows exactly how deep it's going. Uh, in this case, we're gonna cut all the way through, so I'm gonna leave it at bottom, tell it that it's three quarters of an inch thick, and we're gonna zero off of the table. So we're gonna, when we're gonna touch the bit and it's gonna let it know exactly where the surface of the table is, and then you know, we're telling it this is three quarters of an inch thick, but if it's a little taller, a little shorter, it doesn't matter um, because at the end of the day, the, the bit is gonna come down to zero, which is gonna be perfectly at the height of the table, not too deep and not too shallow. The tool path zero down here is just where on the X, Y coordinates of the material you're gonna be zeroing. So right now it's lower left, um, but you could change that depending on what you wanted to do. And as you get more experience, you might change that, but in general, it's in the lower left. The material, um, it's kind of like MDF, so we'll put it at that. It is the Shapoko XXL. Uh, retract height is how high the bit comes above your material between cuts. So half an inch is fine, and we'll leave it in inches. All right, so then we've done the setup. That's just to change the grid. That's a background if you wanted to put like a picture of your material. And then here are the vectors. So vectors just mean shape that you shapes that you can design in the computer. Um, you know, we'll just we can take a circle and you know make a circle, and then it asks us how how big we want the circle to be, and I'll tell it a you know four inch radius. So that's a an eight inch diameter circle, and so that's pretty big. And now we can transform it, which means change it. Um, so here's moving. So as an example of moving it, we can go like that and you know this is if we wanted to tell it the position exactly so if we wanted this circle to be exactly in the middle of our piece of wood we could choose the middle and then we know you know that this is 19 so we would take half of that so nine and a half and tell it we were going to be there and then the height was 12 so that'd be six and so now it's right in the middle of our piece um, so we could, we could do that over here is the tool to scale it, to make it bigger, smaller, rotating, mirroring, offsetting, aligning. So if you had multiple shapes and we wanted to make them, you know, circles concentric, or we wanted to line things up in a certain way, we could do that. And then here's the node edit. So you can actually click on the nodes of a circle and say, whoop, you know, do different things to it. So for people who are familiar with easel, it will probably look very similar in, in that it has similar capabilities, but it, the visually. So for people who are familiar with easel, you'll probably notice a lot of the same features. They just look pretty different. Um, so, you know, there are all these other shapes and whatnot we can, you know, we could make. Connect it back there. Now, let's say that in fact, you, you wanted to import a file because you already had a file made and you just wanted to bring it in here. So we'll just delete these. Then you can see over here that it shows the op option to import. So we can bring in a file and it's looking for vector files. So DXF, SVG, files like that that you've made in Inkscape or Illustrator, and then you just want the bit to trace it. Another option is trace image. So here you can bring in a PNG or JPEG or something like that, and it will try to trace that image to convert it from a bitmap, which is just a bunch of pixels, to a path for it to follow, a vector. But I will undelete those shapes that, that we made because we'll keep using those. And now we can, well, maybe let's, let's put these shapes within each other. So I'll select this and click move. 
and we will move this to within the shape. So now we have two shapes going on to make it a little more interesting. And we can go over to tool paths. And now for each path that we've made here, we need to tell it what we want to do with that line. Right now it's just a line. So up here you can see these two tabs, the design. This is just the shapes that we make. And then tool paths is where we take those designs and actually make it into a cutting path. So it knows what to do with it. So we'll start with this weird shape and we'll tell it we're gonna make a pocket out of that. So here, here we have some options. Contour means following a line pretty much. Pocket is where we'll take this and remove the material on the inside to a certain depth. Um, texture is kind of a cool thing. So you, know, you can just, it, it can automatically make different textures. So you define it here and um, that's kind of a neat thing to play around with, but we're gonna not do that. Drill would be to drill a hole. So you would have spots on there and, and just tell it to drill holes. Uh, and then V-carve and advanced V-carve, which to be honest, I'm not too familiar with. Uh, you're welcome to use vcarve and, and pull those files into here, but I'm not quite sure what those buttons do just yet. So what we're going to do is make this a pocket. So we're going to click pocket. It's going to first ask us what tool we're going to use. So we're going to click in here. And right now we just happen to have a particular tool in there. So I'm going to select that tool. So the machine is a Shapoko and the material, we'll call it MDF. And we'll click under here. And then the, there are end mills, which are what we looked at. They have square bottoms, so they, they you know, cut out shapes. Ball mills have a round bottom. So yeah, it doesn't show a picture, but they will you know, cut smoother designs. A V is a V-shaped tool. So that can cut you know, crisp things and signs, or if you wanted to really fine detail. And an engraver have even you know, finer points. So we're just gonna use a normal end mill. And it's gonna be a quarter inch end mill. We can click on this and it says it has three flutes, but that's not what we're using. Ours has two flutes. Um, so I will grab the bit just so you can see what we're, what we're using. So this is the bit that we're gonna use and it's a quarter inch in diameter and you can see it has two flutes. This bit is gonna spin like this. They all, bits always spin counterclockwise, or sorry, clockwise when you're looking at them from the top. And you can see that if this were cutting, it's gonna take a piece of wood and it's gonna pick it up and carry it upwards. So this is what's called an upcut bit. There's another kind where the blades actually, the flutes go the other way. So as it's cutting, it cuts a piece of wood. Say it's, let's say it's moving this way, la 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 la. And it picks up a piece of wood here. Instead of going up, it would push it downwards. And that has a benefit because if you're cutting a piece of plywood, that top layer of the plywood is gonna get pushed down, which will give it a nice smooth surface. Here with this upcut bit, as it comes along and, and cuts, let's say it's moving this way, it's gonna take that top piece of plywood and tear it upwards. So it'll leave a smooth finish on the bottom down here, but a rough finish on top. So you use an upcut bit. Upcut bits also get rid of the sawdust better so they can cut faster. So we, in general, I use upcut bits, but downcut bits will leave less tear out on the surface. So sometimes those are preferable. We can see the flute length here. Um, it might even say it on here. So on this bit, it all that it says is that it's a quarter inch, but we can measure the flute length. So the flute length is one inch. Um, so that's how deep it can, it can you know, be, be cutting sideways. You can cut deeper that way, but let's say we had material like, you know, this material and you tried cutting like that. Well, this piece isn't going to cut anything. So it's just going to burn. It's just going to push there. You can only cut up to that depth. Over here, we have lots of bits available. So these are just communal bits that are available. We have others for sale in the store in the back. You're welcome to buy. Here's some more communal bits that you're welcome to, to, to pull from. Uh, all different shapes and sorts. And there's an end mill sharpener in the metal shop if you want to sharpen an end mill because it's dull. So here we can see that we have this quarter inch end mill with two flutes and the flute length here is three quarters of an inch instead of our one inch. Um, that's fine because we're not begin gonna be using that full one inch of, of cutting depth. Um, however, what it, if, if you did want to make your own tool so that it matched what you were doing more precisely, you can go into this user-made tool list and then you know click 
new tool and, and make your own tool there and enter all the specifications for it. You can also copy one of the existing tools and then paste it in so that it has most of those values filled out and you can just modify it a little bit. But for now, we're just gonna use this one, click OK. And yep, all those things look good. It, it's automatically setting the step over. So the step over is every time this bit makes a pass. So you can see here all the passes, it's, I'm sorry, all the, all the well, all paths it's gonna make, how much it steps over each time. So it's gonna be stepping over an eighth of an inch each time. It's gonna take off 50 thousandths of an inch with each pass. Uh, these are the plunge rate is how quickly it goes down. So it's 12 inches per minute. And the feed rate is 90 inches per minute. So that's how fast it's gonna be moving. And the RPM is how fast, how many rotations per minute the spindle is gonna be spinning at. So we'll click OK. Then over here on the start depth, we're gonna tell it zero because it's gonna start at the stock top, you know, which is, which is zero. It's not gonna start down at a certain depth, so S is just zero there. And then the max depth, how deep we want that pocket, we'll just say 0.1 inches because we don't need to waste time. You know, the point is just to show how it's working, but you could edit this. And let's say we wanted to go all the way through. We want to remove all that material. You could hit stock bottom. It knows it's three quarters of an inch of an inch deep, so that's how deep we go, but we can just do that point one and click OK. And the name of this is Pocket Toolpath 1. We could name it Pocket Polygon. OK, so there's Pocket Polygon, and it shows what that will look like based on those things we just did. And we could show the simulation for it. So right now it's showing it in aluminum. We can change that to MDF, it doesn't make any difference but it's just showing what it will do over here. Uh, and you can see that the pocket that it makes. And next, we're gonna do another tool path. We're gonna hide the simulation here so that we can select this other path that we made and tell it we're gonna do that as a contour. So the contour, again, is gonna start at zero, start at the surface. The depth is gonna go all the way through, so we're gonna use stock bottom. Um, the tool path settings the direction it's going to be cutting on the inside of our lines, so that blue line um, to, to the left. So that's, um, we could change that, you know, if we wanted to sit right on the line or we wanted it to be on the other side, but for us, outside right, it makes, doesn't, let's pretend we really cared about this shape, so we wanted to cut on the outside to maintain that, we would cut on the outside. Then we want tabs. So if we just cut through this, then this piece of wood would just come flying out as soon as we cut through which would not be good. So to avoid that, what we're gonna do is use tabs. And, um, and, and I skipped this up here, but the tool is pre-selected. So it's the same tool as we have been using. Edit tabs. Um, it says click on source vectors to place tabs. So we're just gonna click around here. And I'll put you know maybe four tabs on. So one, two, three, four. And those are spots where the tool is just gonna come up a little bit so that it doesn't cut all the way through there so it doesn't come flying out. And the tab width is here about half an inch and the height is about an eighth of an inch. Let's we'll click OK and it's just added those four tabs for us. And now contour tool path one, we'll just call that like outline um, cut. Because it's not engraving, it's cutting all the way through. So we'll click OK. And now we have these two tool paths that we're gonna cut on. And you can see you know, which one's which. And we're, you could you know, save them separately. So if you just wanted to, we could disable it so that it, we only export one at a time. If for some reason you just wanted to do bits and pieces. Obviously we can also have other things in this design. We could have another tool path over here that, I'm sorry, we could have another design path over here and not turn it into a tool path. So even though this is the shape is here, we haven't made a tool path for it. So it's not gonna do anything. It's just when we save the G code, which is what's gonna actually tell the machine what to do, that is gonna get totally ignored. So I'm just gonna un I'm gonna enable that. And we can save the G code. And what you can do is just make your own folder um, under so on the desktop there's a folder called project files and you can make your own by going to new folder. So here's mine. 
and I'm just going to call this kidney bean and click save. So now this design is saved and we're going to go over to carbide motion, which is what actually controls the machine. So open you up. And first we need to connect to the cutter. So the cutter's already on. We push the, the blue button so that it's turned on. And now it's just going to think about it. So now it's, now it's connected and we can click on initialize. Well, let, we can load the file first. So we'll click load kidney bean. And now it's here. We can click view. And this is literally the G code. So this is the instructions that are being sent to the motor. So it knows exactly where to go and what to do with each step. We're going to initialize the machine and we can watch it. Right now it's initialing the X and Y axes. So it's going all the way to the back. It's finding how far back it can go. Now it's going over on the X to find how far sideways it can go. And, and then once it's done that, it knows where it is. Just when it turns on, it has no idea where it is. So now, now it knows. And now it's going to come over to the front so that we can put a bit in it, which is very considerate. And in fact, it says, please insert a tool. So we will kind of do that. We're going to do a slightly different step first. So what we want to do is we want to tell the machine exactly where our material is so that it knows where to cut. And we have a nifty accessory for this tool that helps make that really easy. And the way it works is we have this. Sorry, we have this guy, which sits right on the corner. And what this is going to allow us to do is the tool can come over and it can go right in that hole, which is sitting right over the corner of our workpiece. And it's going to touch here and touch here. And then right in the middle is the edge of the workpiece on the, on the X axis. And then similarly here, it'll touch, touch. So it'll know exactly where the Y limit of our piece is and then it can touch on the surface, but we're gonna put it down on the surface of the material because remember we set the zero as the work surface. So we're gonna to touch there. But first we need to load the thing in. Now let's say that we were using this in there, this, this end mill. Well, let's say it was oriented like this and it touched the side like that. Well, that's a slightly different position than if it was turned like this. So what we need to do is actually, we're gonna use a different tool. We're gonna to use this little guy, which is the Shipoko probe. And um, we have two different sizes for the different size collets. So we're gonna load that up in here so that we can use this because it's a perfect cylinder. It'll touch just on the sides where evenly on both sides. So the first step to doing that is removing this dust shoe. So this just pops off very neatly and then this is just going to go right up in here in this collet but first we're going to remove this so you can see how the collet system works on on this router this is just a router that's mounted right on here so here you can see the collet nut what i just unscrewed and then this collet which lives right inside of it and so the collet takes only one size in this case this this eighth, eighth in, or sorry quarter inch bit and it just squeezes down on it. So it pinches it really hard to get a nice firm grip. And we could change that. So over in here, we have, so down in here, we have a different size collet and this is the eighth inch one. So let's say you wanted to use an eighth inch bit. Well, then you could swap out the collet. So this just lives in there. And we're gonna put this one right back in and it goes in there just like that. And we'll screw it right back up into the end of the spindle or the router. And we're gonna put this probe in just like that, right into the collet and continue to tighten. All right, and now I'm gonna grab this wrench, which is the Shipoko wrench and use it to tighten this. So the way to tighten it is you put the wrench right on this collet nut and there's a button right in the back here and you're gonna push that button and that will lock the spindle or the, the router so it can't spin on you. So we're gonna just turn it and now I'm pushing that in so it can't spin and use the wrench to tighten it. 
Um, in this case, we're looking at it from the top. So it's lefty loosey righty tighty from the bottom, but from the top it's the opposite. So we're snugging it down by by turning it in this case this direction, which from the top, from my perspective, is counterclockwise. So now it's locked in there. And what it wants to do over here is we've inserted the tool, so I'm going to click resume. And it's going over, and it's going to touch this bit setter with, with what is not actually an end mill, so it knows exactly how long it is. And it's just touching again to be very precise. All right. back up and back to the middle very considerate and now what we can do is we're gonna take this this little magnet piece and we can check to make sure it works by touching it and you can see how it turns red so it, whenever it makes electrical contact it turns red and we're just gonna take this magnet and stick it right on there right on that collet nut and then using the computer over here we're gonna go to jog so right now we're at run so we can see, you know, we could run this program, but we're gonna go over to jog. We can change the increment, which is how much it moves by. So right now it's moving by a thousandth of an inch. So if we click X plus, I mean, it's moving a teensy, teensy, teensy amount, but we're gonna increase it up to fast. Now, right now, if we tell it to go down into the table, it will go down into the table and break itself, or at least make itself unhappy. So it's very important when you put it in fast mode or even you know 0.1 inches to be aware of that so uh, that you don't, you don't hurt the machine. So I'm going to click X negative. You can also use the arrow keys on the keyboard. And clicking X negative tells it to go towards us, which in this case is X negative. And I've put that little um, tool probe or material touch-off probe right on the corner of the material. So you can see that it's sitting right on the corner here, just like that. And we want it to be sitting so that it isn't moving on us, so just on the corner. Sometimes you have to finagle the wires a little bit. And now what I'm going to do from the computer is move it so that the bit is sitting just inside of that little hole. So down inside that hole a little bit, and you'll see why in a second. So I'm just going to move it over and then Y up a little bit and now Z down a little bit. Now we're closer. I'm going to decrease the increment to 0 0.01 inches so I don't make any mistakes and hit anything. And now down. All right, so now we're down in that hole, and what we can do is now I'm gonna click probe. So you can click probe right on the screen here and tell it we have the bit zero V2, the one on the right, and we wanna probe the corner. So you could do the Z, the height, the X, or the Y individually, but we're just gonna click the corner, and it's telling us that the green LED is on. We verified that it works by touching it. it made the red LED, and now we put it over the corner inside the bore. So we're ready to begin the probe. If you go over here, you can see it touched. Now it's coming over and touching, so it's finding its, its position on the x-axis, and now it's finding its position on the y-axis. So you might recall that on the old Shapoka, we had to do this visually, uh, or with a piece of paper, so this is a big improvement. And now it's doing the Z, but we're actually gonna touch off, off the work surface, so we're gonna forget about that. All right, so now it's saying that its position is x.394, y.394. So that, what that's saying is that it knows that the corner of the material is right there, and it's a little, and it's like 0.394 and 0.394 inches away from that corner. Um, now what we're gonna do is we are gonna tell it where the surface of the table is. But let's say we did it with this tool, and then we took this out and put in our own, the actual cutting end mill. Well, the end mill, we're going to put in at a random length. It's not going to stick out the same exact amount as this piece. And so what that would do is it would, it would mess it up. So what we need to do is now we need to put the actual end mill back in there. 
and the end of the end mill is flat. And so what that means is we can try and get to focus. We can get it to when it touches off on the surface of the table, since it's perfectly flat, it's okay versus the sides, which are not, you know, can be wider or skinnier depending on the orientation. So we're going to come back over here and go to run and we're going to tell it, Hey, we're actually loading a new tool and it's coming up we can disconnect that little magnet guy put in our new tool, which is the, the actual end mill we're gonna use. So push this button until it locks in, and then loosen it, just like that. Pull this out and put it back in this little box. Take this end mill, slide it in there. And you don't wanna, you only wanna hold up above the flutes. So you wanna have a good bite on it, but you don't wanna be on the flutes. And then we're going to push the button again, tighten first with my fingers, and now with that wrench, let's get it snug, doesn't need to be crazy. Wrench away, and we've disconnected the magnet because it's going to go jog over there. So if it's still connected to the magnet, it would have a little problem. It would just pop off, but it wouldn't be super happy. So it even knows that we're putting in that quarter inch end mill. This actually says down cut, I'm just noticing, but it's fine. It doesn't make a lot of difference. It just thinks that it's a down cut, even though it's an up cut bit as we covered before. So we'll click resume. Now it's running over there or jogging as it's called and going down. So it figures out the, how, how long that bit is exactly where it is. Okay. And now what we're going to do is touch off the work surface. So we're going to go back to jog over here. And now we, we're going to tell it to probe. But before we do that, when you probe, you need to be pretty close to it. So we can't, you know, just, we, we need to get it pretty close before we start probing. So we're going to bring it over here and go almost on top of it. So I'm going to increase the increment to fast and I'm going to use the arrow keys. Just so we can bring it over here a little more quickly. And this way. And then we're going to bring the Z down. And I don't know, there might be an arrow key shortcut for that, but I'm just using the mouse. And something to note is that if we push over here, it rocks. So we're going to push over on this side where it doesn't rock. And this is something important to note is that let's say we were touching off the top surface of our material. You actually put it on top of the material. You don't set it on the corner. Um, and yeah, so you would, you would take it and put it up on top of the material, which is important to know or else you'll be off by a little bit because it knows how thick this, this thing is. And so if it's down a little bit, it'll have the wrong thickness. So we're going to put that there. We're going to attach our magnet. So here's our magnet. We're just going to stick on just anywhere, anywhere on there that's metal. We'll be fine. And now we're going to bring it right over. And then I'm going to bring it closer because if we're too far away, when it starts probing, it'll just be like, I don't know, this thing is too far away. We're just going to stop. All right, so now we're close. I'm going to go over here and click probe and the uh, bit zero V two, and we're just going to do Z and it's going to tell us position probe on surface. Um, and then position the cutter above probe surface Again, probe comes down. Now, if you hadn't attached the magnet on there, then it would just keep searching, right? It would smash right into there until it had a problem. Um, if you do that, you'll probably have to turn off and turn on the machine because it's going to be like, oh, we just had a calamity there. So it's very important to remember to attach the magnet so that it can detect when it touches the metal. It also won't know. It'll just try to keep going. All right, so now we have our Z set off the bottom, which is how we told the program, the file that we made, it was going to be set off the work surface. Um, and here, this we don't we control the spindle manually, so that wouldn't do anything for us. 
set zero would be to, to manually set the zeros wherever we are instead of using that cool probe that we have. Rapid position, we would put in the coordinates and then tell it exactly where we want it to go. And probe, we're now very familiar with. Up here, MDI is you can send it G-code commands if you are so inclined. And settings, hopefully you won't need to get into settings um, because that could potentially mess things up. So we'll go back to run. And now, uh, I'm just gonna put this probe away because we're all done probing. So it goes back in its little box home up there. And this guy can go over here. And this little dust shoe will flip right on there magnetically, which is great. And I'm gonna grab hearing protection. Between the spindle and the vacuum, it's a pretty loud situation. So now what we can do is it knows the position. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell it to start. So we're gonna click start job and start. And so now it's coming up and it's just gonna remeasure that tool again, just to make extra sure that it knows what it's doing. So we're gonna tell it, yep, we've already put that tool in. You can resume and it's gonna go over there and touch off. All right, and now it's gonna tell us, hey, set the spindle to 18,000 RPM. And then we look at the top and it just has some random numbers. That's not very helpful. So we look at this chart, and over on the chart, it says that 18,000 RPM on the right corresponds to the number three. So over here, we'll see that it is in fact set to number three. So that's the proper speed for, the, um, for that spindle, or for, for this program. So, um, and then as long as we're over here, you can just see there's this note about the, in the store, we have these milling bits available for sale in the, in the back store at Makehaven. So if you want to buy brand new bits instead of using or, or sharpening your own over here, and I'm just going to move this out of the way. So there's no obstacles and, uh, well, we actually need to turn it on. So we're just going to click this on button. That gets started. We're going to turn the vacuum on up here. That's important. Ta-da! So that was pretty quick. This is a powerful, rigid machine, so it can take off pretty deep cuts at a time. Uh, you can see, so we'll, we'll just jog it to get it out of the way now. We could just turn the machine off and, and move it manually. When, it, when it's off, you can just push it. Um, I don't, click, we just clicked resume. Um, so now it moves itself out of the way, which is very nice of it. it. Goes all the way to the back, giving us lots of space. So you can see down here, that those are the tabs that it made, so it didn't come flying out. It's still nicely in there, and we can just use a razor blade to, to pop that out. Here's our nice pocket. You can see a little bit of tear out on the edges because we're using an up cut instead of a down cut bit. Um, and we can take this out just to see you know, how good a job we did of zeroing off of the surface of the table so that it doesn't cut into our table. The hope is obviously that be just right, not too shallow and not too deep, so it doesn't mess up our, our table so we can have this last as long as possible. 
if you do cut into the table, that's not the end of the world. You can see here that you know there, there's a little hole, and then here it looks like there's like just maybe a shadow, and then here it actually did cut in a little bit, which is interesting. Um, I'm not sure why there was a difference, um, but you know, with time, I guess we'll we'll see. You know, if that's the case, it was pretty good. You know, in that it was almost negligible here. It was entirely negligible here, which is where we zeroed, interestingly. Uh, but that's the goal in general: is just to make as little mark on here as possible, so we don't need to remove these very frequently, and and replace them. So we have our lovely kidney bean shape. Um, I just popped it right out. You know, if we were wanting it to be nice, I might cut it out more nicely. We can just sort of cut off or sand off those pieces. And now we have our, our shape on here. Um, the vacuum did a great job. There's just a little bit left of cleanup to do. Obviously, we need to put the clamps away when we're done and all the accessories go away. Um, if you, let's say you make something in Fusion 360 or SolidWorks, a, a fully three-dimensional design, then you can just open it up as a, as a new file in here. You would just skip the step of using the carbide create. You would just open it right up into carbide motion and run the program, no problem. When you're done, you're just gonna make sure everything is cleaned up. That vacuum it will fill up, so it just has a, has a paper shop vac bag inside of it. The extra bags live right over there on top of the cabinet, so you could put a replacement bag in here for when it needs it, um, when it stops pulling dust quite as well. And then when you're done, just make sure to turn off the machine and you're good to go. Thanks for watching.